So you should just remember that canonization is no astounding event. Some earth moving, earth shaking uh, procedure. It's it's what the church says goes into the Bible at that time. And as the years change and other things changes, there are adaptations to it. All scripture is divinely derived. Yeah, that's uh, that's constantly invoked by people that say the Bible claims to be inspired. Uh, that, what, a, what a hoax this is. I mean, whoever wrote this, uh, one of the so-called Pauline writers, the pastoral author, they call him often, uh, he's certainly referring to what was considered scripture by Jews and Christians at the time, whatever that was. Not everyone agreed what constituted the Old Testament. They were still having debates at that time as to what stories should be a part of the Bible. So we don't quite know which books he had in mind, but it's more or less the Septuagint. It seems to me darn near impossible to imagine this author is thinking of the New Testament books. This is what Bible literalists claim is their authority to assert and to believe that all scripture is literally so, divinely so. The Gospels were not written when Paul made that assertion. So what scriptures could he possibly be talking about? The only scriptures that he could possibly be referring to are the Hebrew scriptures. Besides Paul's writings, the New Testament had not even been written. So how could all scripture really have been divinely inspired? My question to these people is this. Who defines what in scripture is allegory and what is fact? Who makes that decision? Is the uh, Exodus story, is that allegory? Is the Genesis story in the Garden of Eden, is that allegory or is that a fact? And who makes these decisions? Was Jesus allegory? I mean, there's a lot of scholars that believe this man never existed. Is that allegory or is that a fact? Who makes that decision? Well, in the Roman Catholic Church, it you know, boils down to the Pope. He's got the last say on this. But there's 220-some Christian religions because they disagree on points like this. The Pope, early on in early Christianity, commissioned the great scholar Jerome to translate what existing scripture there was into Latin, which is known as the Vulgate Bible. One of his instructions to Jerome is to figure out which of the many, many translations he had of the Gospel of Matthew should be used. There were many. Canonization is the process that determines what is written into the Bible. Canonization therefore affects the nature of various Christian religions. So few people are aware that the popular King James Version is not the only canonized Bible. There are actually four plus a variety of offshoots. Uh, the Western Church has pretty much agreed on the New Testament canon by about 400, but there was still this problem uh, that the uh, Eastern Churches didn't like Revelation and the Western ones didn't like Hebrews, and they finally ironed it out, and by 600 more or less, they were able to do the horse trade and, and get an agreement on that. The canonizing process was instead a function of an oral, illiterate church where the pastor or the bishop or somebody who knew enough to read out loud to us by the hour, um, what should that person read? Is this book good stuff to read? or is this book going to mislead the people, create problems, doubts, and so forth? The original issue was not what stories to put into the New Testament, but what to read out loud in church. And when you see what they put in the Bible, you see they still didn't quite know. They sometimes would add a couple of books which they shouldn't have, which we don't have in the New Testament so that 
There was a little fluidity as to the exact list. The Western Bible, the one we are more familiar with, was translated from Aramaic and Hebrew to Greek, to Latin, to German, to English, and so on and so on. A recent scholar, George Lampson, decided to publish the Eastern Orthodox Bible from Aramaic, the spoken language 2,000 years ago, directly to English in order to avoid all of the translation errors. The problem was that he could not find a publisher in the United States. Eventually, he was successful. Publisher that said he would publish it with one under one condition on what side. It's that they add the Book of Revelation to it. So this explains why when I went through both of these Bibles, the Eastern and Western versions, word by word, and found all these differences, until Revelation, I found not a difference in the world. All she did was copy the prevailing stuff from the day. One of the many reasons the Eastern Orthodox Church opted to omit Revelation from its canonized Bible is because it depicts Jesus exactly opposite as do the Gospels. Revelation has Jesus mounted on a white horse, dressed in a white robe, dripping with blood, and with a sword in his teeth, getting ready to smite nations. Hardly the love your enemies and turn the other cheek Apologists' explanations for this are inadequate. The latest scripture, actual scripture that we have from Jews is about a thousand years old. It was in Jewish tradition that when a copyist would copy one Bible as being worn out, they would discard the old one. So we do not have a succession of evidence that would show what changes could have occurred over the years. Until the Dead Sea Scrolls, which generally date between 150 BCE and 70 CE. When somebody says that their religion is based on the canonization, they are probably not even aware that there are other canonizations that differ from their particular beliefs. So you should just remember that canonization is no astounding event. Some earth moving earth-shaking uh, procedure, it's, it's what the church says goes into the Bible at that time. And as the years change and other things changes, there are adaptations to it.